My name is Pat Brown, um, and I'm the CEO and founder of Impossible Foods. As a kid, and I think this is true of probably most scientists, I just wanted to learn things all the time, and uh, I wasn't a particularly good student. Got pretty bad grades in high school, but um, fortunately, when I was uh, applying for college, they, the admission criteria were more lenient than they are today. So. I went to college and graduate school in biochemistry and medical school at the University of Chicago. My PhD was basically figuring out the mechanism of a, an enzyme that passes DNA molecules to one another. It doesn't have much to do with food, nor does anything else I've done since. You know, in my science career, I bounced around from one thing to another, um, just basically whatever seemed interesting. And then uh, I went to uh, Stanford. Anyway, but I wasn't making, I didn't have a conscious, you know, career plan. Uh, I realized that, um, first of all, we're in, a, we're in a very dire state in terms of destructive um, impacts on the environment that, that we're really like within decades of irreparable damage to the viability of the planet for humans. We have to radically change a lot about the global agricultural system. That has lots of challenges. And then there's the basic science of figuring out, you know, how to build a technology platform to replace animals in the food system. And I relatively quickly came to the conclusion that, you know, the only way to solve the problem is to find a better technology for doing what we currently use animals to do in the food system. And again, since no one was working on it, I just felt like, oh, it's too important for me not to do. So I quit a job I loved. I didn't have any qualms about it. I just bailed immediately and, um, found it impossible foods to work on that problem. Made. I don't worry about the fact that I'm not competent at something, you know, when I decide to do it. Like, I just feel like, I, I didn't know anything about the mechanics of scientific publishing. I, I, I was the, one of the least pop qualified people in the world to found a food company because I don't have business experience. I'm not interested in business. I don't have food experience. I'm not interested in food, but it just seemed like, okay, well, this is what I have to do. Um, for us to succeed in our mission, which I have no doubt we will, we have to double, effectively double in scale every year for the next 15 years. That has all kinds of challenges. You get surprised by things every single day. And most of them are good surprises. Some of them are bad surprises, but in a way, the bad surprises are just another challenge to overcome. So yeah, it's great, it's fun. So um, I wanna start by um, talking about uh, why I got into what turned out to be impossible food. So at the time, um, as Jennifer said, I, I was I been at Stanford uh, in the medical school for 25 years. It was I really felt like it was the best job in the world. Um, I had um, basically complete freedom to follow my curiosity wherever it took me, and um, and you know discover and invent things. And basically my job was to do that and to help students learn how to, to do the same thing and uh, just in a great environment with great people and so forth. And I really loved that job. I mean, I really basically loved basically every day, eager to go in and so forth. And, and I had great students and so uh, you can imagine that was a blast. Um, but what happened uh, about 12 years ago, was I had a sabbatical and I, I wanted to take the time to really step back and think about what is, with no particular conditions, what is the most important problem in the world that I could potentially contribute to solving? And I very quickly honed in on the problem that I've been working on ever since, um, which is, uh, hang on, which is this. Um, that at the time there was no one seriously working on this and it was virtually unrecognized. I could give you all the examples that people who shouldn't pay attention just were completely ignoring this. Um, but uh, what I came to realize by just do, looking into analyzing the evidence and synthesizing is that, and I'll explain to you why this is true, the use of animals of food technology is the greatest threat to our planet and arguably the most destructive technology in human history. And the problem was that I think because people just sort of thought of this as a, a natural extension of nature uh, or something like that. Um, and besides which the food 
people, the food industry is incredibly uninnovative. People just think it is what it is. And maybe we'll, you know, come up with a new flavor of Fruit Loops every now and then. But, but basically, it just is what it is. Um, so, so this problem was just essentially ignored. In fact, even ignored by large environmental groups um, that that would create models for how we could make the world better. And 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 this was never even a part of it. Okay. So, so that that I decided I wanted to dive into. Now, let me just show you some of the reasons why that statement that this is the most destructive technology on, on Earth and the greatest threat, um, I would say that humans have ever faced is, first of all, we are in the very late stages of you know, what can only be called a catastrophic collapse of global biodiversity. And this is just one metric of it. Um, and it's from a study that's been going on for 50 years, a, a large consortium that's largely funded and headed by the World Wildlife Fund and the Zoological Society of London. And they've been taking um, basically censuses of uh, more than 4,000 species around the globe that are intended to be a representative sample of animal biodiversity at large. And every, every you know, they've been doing this at regular intervals. And what they most recently reported is that, and it's been a steady, steady decline, that the, the um, average population of this huge um, diversity of species today is less than a third what it was 50 years ago, okay? That, that is, I, every time I say that or look at it, I just feel like that is so shocking and disturbing. And the problem isn't just that, you know, if you like nature and wildlife, well, this sucks, but um, also that these species, diverse species, are critical components of what you could call the web of life, the, the global ecosystems that um, keep our planet basically alive and functioning. And you take out these species and it takes a while for the full effect to be felt. Just think, you know, some of these animals are uh, critical pollinators. Some of them are uh, critical dispersers of seeds or, or responsible for uh, recycling dead biomass and so forth, okay? You, you, you don't realize what you're missing until those trees that depend on them for pollination and seed dispersal, you know, die and nothing replaces them. So this is just the leading edge of an even bigger catastrophe, okay? Now, what does that have to do with my theme? Well, basically, it's almost entirely due to the use of animals for food, the use of animals as food technology. This is a, a figure from a, a recent report on this ongoing study. And I won't go through all the sectors, but, but um, what it shows, it tries to break down, obviously this is not precise, but what are the principal drivers of this collapse? And on the right, this uh, kind of teal sector basically represents exploitation. It's overfishing and, and hunting, mostly overfishing, which is almost entirely responsible for the collapse of global fish populations. And then the, uh, the uh, sort of magenta and green sectors represent respectively habitat degradation and destruction. Um, and, and you can see that they account for overwhelmingly the whole thing. The other components actually are also significantly related to use of animals for food. But obviously over, overfishing is that habitat destruction and degradation is almost entirely due to the massive land footprint of animal agriculture. So today, um, by uh, estimates from, for example, the International Livestock Research Organization, which is a very pro livestock organization, 45% of Earth's ice-free land surface is currently devoted to either uh, grazing or raiding, raising feed crops for uh, livestock. And uh, in fact, in the US, according to the USDA Census of Agriculture, 48% of the continental US is devoted to raising animals for food. So this is pretty ubiquitous. And um, that, by the way, that huge land footprint, just to give in perspective, um, every city on earth um, that's, that's 
uh, uh, got any reasonable population could fit on one percent of Earth's surface. If you if you if you put them all together, and every human built structure, uh, road, building, parking lot, whatever, uh, fits on about two percent of Earth's surface. So, um, and all the crops that are grown for human consumption fit on less than seven percent of Earth's surface. So, animal agriculture is about uh, is more than eighty percent of the entire land footprint. Of humanity. Um, the demand for meat is going up very fast, faster than population growth, because not only do you have more people, but the per capita demand is, is going up as, as people uh, acquire the means to, to buy these foods. Well, Earth is not getting any bigger, as you may have noticed. And uh, so the only way that you can meet the demand is create uh, is devoting more land to animal agriculture. And, and that's why this technology, this, this use is almost entirely responsible for the ongoing destruction of the Amazon and tropical uh, rainforests and other um, uh, um, critical ecosystems in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. Okay, this has been going on um, uh, historically, that's, that's how we got to 45%. And um, this is kind of the craziness of it um, as of now. So um, today, the, the cows living on Earth, first of all, we have, we have 1.7 billion cows living on Earth, okay? And if you put them all together on a scale and you put every remaining wild mammal, bird, reptile, and amphibian together on a scale, every terrestrial vertebrate on a scale, the cows outweigh every remaining wild terrestrial vertebrate combined by more than a factor of 10, okay? The pigs that are being raised for food outweigh every remaining wild terrestrial vertebrate by more than 50%. Sheep and goats outweigh every remaining wild terrestrial vertebrate by more than 25%. And the uh, poultry being raised for human consumption outweigh every remaining wild bird by more than a factor of three, okay? So basically it's literally true that you know, we're replacing nature with livestock. And these, these, the, the, it's the ridiculousness of it is that not only don't you need any animal products at all for, for optimal health and nutrition, but these cows that are the biggest problem, okay, the biggest land footprint, the biggest resource footprint, produce only 12% of the human, uh, um, of the protein in the human diet, okay? So for that pittance, um, uh, we're destroying the planet. Okay, now this is not moving properly. Oh, here we go. Is that the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So this is, um, I think, an illustration of the problem and then the opportunity that that uh, Impossible Foods is trying to unlock. So this is um, uh, for people who have ever lived in Northern California. It's a beautiful peninsula north of San Francisco called Point Reyes. Half of it is essentially protected wilderness in a national, uh, effectively a national park. And the other half of it is um, farms raising um, cattle for beef and uh, dairy. Okay. So what we're looking at here is a, a trail. If you're an aficionado, this is the trail to Abbott's Lagoon and my beautiful wife walking down the trail. And what you can see, she's surrounded by basically uh, um, typical native California coastal ecosystem. So very diverse um, uh, plants and also you can't really see them, but uh, very diverse uh, uh, wildlife species as well. To the left, you see a uh, barbed wire fence. And on the other side of that fence is what calls itself, and I kid you not, a sustainable organic grass-fed beef farm, okay? So this is, when you, when you buy your sustainable organic grass-fed beef from Marin County, um, you're probably picturing something more like what's on the right. This is where it comes from. And what this illustrates is how the, the impact of, of animal agriculture, and again, particularly cows, on both the biodiversity and the total biomass on the land that they occupy. You can calculate the, um, 
uh, you multiply this globally, okay? So this is a microcosm of the world. And you multiply the land footprint, multiply this by the land footprint of agriculture. And there have been calculations, there have been now three papers that have addressed this in various ways, two were in the past year, that basically converge on the conclusion that the, the total amount of biomass that was lost as land was converted for animal farming from its original state is the greenhouse gas equivalent of 16 to 18 years worth of total global greenhouse gas emissions at the 2018 rate. And that's pretty much the same as this rate, okay? That, that is uh, um, the current state, but it also represents an amazing opportunity, which is if we could just replace that technology, that incredibly destructive and unnecessary technology um, with a, a better way to satisfy it, the, the market it serves, you would unlock the recovery of biomass on this vast amount of land that could literally turn back the clock on climate change by pulling out of the atmosphere. The only way you can get CO2 out of the atmosphere is photosynthesis. And you have to, you need, you know, you need to have, plants need to be able to grow to unlock it. And there's vast amount of potential for plant growth on, on that land footprint. So you could actually um, uh, lower atmospheric CO2 and in the process, restore healthy ecosystems to, to reverse this global collapse of biodiversity, okay? So does that sound worth doing? I think it sort of does. And um, this is just a further illustration on, on the impact on climate. This is from a study I actually just published with my former postdoc and good, good fellow subversive radical uh, Mike Eisen. Um, we analyzed uh, um, just a bunch of data that is in the public domain. It's, it's, it's in the IPCC reports and, and, and you know, readily accessible to calculate the actual global, global warming impact uh, uh, of eliminating animals as a food technology, okay? And um, it's incredibly huge. There's two huge factors that are unleashed. If we could over the, this illustrates what would happen if over the next 15 years, which is impossible foods target window, we completely replace animals in the food system. Two major mechanisms would kick in. Well, first of all, you're gonna reduce ongoing uh, livestock related CO2 emissions. That's a small factor. That's this, this tan sector here. Oh, and I should say the, the uh, black line at the top is the trajectory that we're on if we, if we keep doing what we're doing. Unfortunately, as of right now, the trajectory is we're just doing worse. <laughs> you know, it's just total greenhouse gas emissions until COVID were actually going up every year. But this is supposed that they just continue as they are. Okay, that's that black line. And you can see radio, radiative forcing is basically uh, a measure of the amount of heat that's being delivered to the surface of Earth, okay? And, and the expectation is that heating, it's kind of like how hard, how high you turn the heat lamp, okay, will double by 2100, okay? Um, so now if we stop using animals in the food system over the next 15 years, again, two things would happen. Number one, this tan sector, that's just, okay, now you eliminate the livestock related CO2 emissions. But the, um, the purple and, and red sectors are interesting because unlike CO2, methane and nitrous oxide, which are two uh, major livestock related greenhouse gases, um, decay spontaneously, okay? If you don't keep emitting them, you don't, you're not stuck with what's already in the atmosphere, it, it decays. So when you turn off that spigot, you get net negative uh, um, emissions from the decay of methane and nitrous oxide. And you, you can calculate, IPCC has calculated, how much uh, methane and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere uh, is due to uh, livestock emissions and, and the decay rates of those things. And the purple and, and red are what you get from the decay of methane and nitrous oxide respectively over time. The green then is the recovery of biomass on this massive amount of land that's currently devoted to animal agriculture. And as I said, it's, it's ultimately the equivalent of 16 to 18 years worth of greenhouse gas emissions. Combine those effects, um, you get the dotted line. And what you can see is 
holy cow, this is an incredible opportunity to put the brakes at least for uh, decades on, um, on climate change and, um, and massively reduce net emissions. So, um, so over the period in this, in this model, if we, in 15 years, we, we totally replace that industry between uh, uh, 2030 and 2060, there would be net zero emissions. There'd be no increase in total atmosphere net greenhouse gases. And then between now and 2100, we would have decreased the net, the total greenhouse gas emissions for the rest of the century by more than 50%, okay? Just by getting rid of this useless, pointless industry. Okay, and if we had a 30 year pause, hopefully we could, we could figure out other long-term solutions to fossil fuels and, and renewable energy and so forth, okay? So, um, and, and, and I, there's a footnote here. If we only replaced beef, we would get half the benefit. So replacing beef alone would, would uh, offset more than 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions through the rest of the century. This is just another way of looking at it. Um, uh, you know, if you had asked me before I did this analysis, was just over the past few months, uh, it was published in, in BioArchive uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, what, uh, what a pound of beef was equivalent to in, say, automobile emissions, um, I would have said the best guess is um, replacing a pound of beef is equivalent to driving um, 33 fewer miles in a typical American car. But what that neglected was um, the opportunity cost um, of that 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 of of not being able to get the benefit of that biomass recovery and methane decay. You take that into account, and over um, between now and 2050, the uh, climate equivalent of replacing a pound of beef is driving 650 fewer miles in a typical American car. Challenge me on this if you want. I, I, I just don't have time to go through the math. Okay, so, so I wanted to solve this problem. And, and just to cut to the chase about what are the options. Well, um, government regulation has zero chance. I mean, if governments try to regulate people's food choices, and you can see, you know, this is this, all this chit chat in, uh, uh, in the news media and so forth. Uh, there would be a, um, uh, an uprising. So um, it's never been effective for governments to try to do that. And, um, and trying to educate and persuade people, I'm a huge fan of education, um, but that ain't gonna work. And, and all, all you have to do is, if you had come with me to the Paris Climate uh, Conference um, five years ago, or whenever it was, um, uh, what you would have seen is some of the most knowledgeable environmentalists in the world all going out to have steak for dinner, okay? So they knew what the problem was. Knowledge isn't enough when, when, you know, uh, when it comes to foods you love to eat. So those aren't options. But there was a really good option that, that to me was like more, kind of more right up my alley. Um, whoops, what was that? Oh, well, it was this, found impossible foods. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, with, with um, basically the idea was to develop a technology platform to replace animals in the food system, and then not just wait around for things to happen, but use it to create foods that compete directly in the marketplace against the foods we make from animals, and basically pull the economic rug out from under the industry that's destroying the planet, okay? Just to be blunt about it. Um, nothing personal, but the most destructive industry on earth needs to go. Um, so this is our mission to, to reverse the collapse of global biodiversity and avert climate catastrophe by completely replacing the use of animals and food technology by 2035. And the strategy, like I said, is straightforward. If we can develop a platform that enables us to make the world's most delicious, nutritious, affordable, and of course, sustainable meat, fish, and dairy foods in the world, and just put them in the market and let the magic of the free market work, let consumers choose, um, it only ends one way and that's with the demise of, of the prehistoric and underperforming technology that we're using now. Um, and um, this is 
may be redundant, but basically, you know, a lot of people, when they know anything about impossible foods, they think, oh, it's a food company, it's making veggie burgers or plant-based food or something like that. But actually inside and in our hearts, we are a, a science and technology company. We are, um, are, are, we are building the technology platform to replace animals as, as the system for producing these foods um, and, um, and thereby solving the problem. Okay, so, so when I found the company, the very first thing we did was, um, you know, start building an R&D team. And fortunately, I, I knew a lot of scientists and I could hit up a lot of my scientist friends to recommend great students and postdocs. So we built the team mostly out of people very early in their career. A lot of them, it was their first job out of school, but they were awesome. And we were trying to hire people who are not only good at, you know, a specific thing, but were just great scientific problem solvers, generalists who could, who could learn fast, learn new fields and, and techniques fast and improvise and, uh, uh, and discover and invent things. So um, by the time the company was, uh, by the time anyone in the outside world had heard about us, and we were probably about three years into this um, and we were outed by the Wall Street Journal. But at that time uh, we had um, about 75 scientists and I think less than 10 people who weren't scientists. And it was pretty much uh, a research lab. And, and that's still the case. It's the center of gravity of the company and uh, uh, is um, R&D because the problem, there's still lots of opportunity for, for progress there. So I, I won't go through all the stuff that we're doing because it's, it's, it's maybe too geeky and it would take a long time, but I'll just talk about uh, one of the uh, most important things that we discovered early in our research. And that was, we obviously asked the question, okay, how, the way we're gonna solve the problem is, is, is take the scientific approach. Okay, we're not just gonna take wild swings at it. We start by understanding how do these foods that people love do what they do. And amazingly, and this is because of food, no one, I apologize to anyone who's in the food world, it's, there's such a lack of curiosity. Um, this is an obvious question to ask. There are 7 billion people in the world that eat meat regularly. Presumably someone has wondered this before, but nobody had ever actually tried to answer this question. I can tell you how I know. Um, so we did. So that was the first question we had to ask is how does meat work as, as a, a biochemical system to produce the, the characteristics that people value? And this is just leading up to it. So first of all, if you take like a vegetable broth, I mean, if you basically take the juice out of any cell, it's mostly the same stuff. You know, it's, it's um, a bunch of, you know, aside from the macromolecules, a bunch of small molecules um, uh, that are, you know, amino acids, vitamins, simple sugars, fatty acids, nucleotides, stuff like that. And um, so imagine vegetable broth. You, you take the juice out of, of vegetable cells, you get vegetable broth. And if you uh, cook it, you get something that's very unimpressive. It's, it's okay, it's a little savory. Um, but meh is the, the correct description. Okay, but add one ingredient and the critical ingredient is heme um, and that vegetable broth turns into beef, okay? It turns into intensely complex and unmistakably meaty flavor profile. Um, so heme, I think most people know, um, uh, who are biochemists anyway, but you know it at least as a molecule that carries oxygen in your blood, makes your blood red. Um, uh, if you know more about it, it's, it's got many functions. It's an essential component of the uh, sort of system that does respiration. It, 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 it uses oxygen to burn calories and produce energy. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, and, it's, and, and because of that, it's essential for pretty much every cell on earth, okay? Animal, plant, bacteria, yeast, you name it. Um, besides the things that are related to carrying and binding oxygen and so forth, it turns out it's also an amazing catalyst. In fact, it's the business end of, of uh, most of the enzymes in your liver, the cytochromes, that metabolize toxins and drugs 
you know, the, the enzymes that, you know, metabolize caffeine. And uh, it's, it's the business end of the enzymes that synthesize uh, steroid hormones. Um, so, you know, uh, cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, all of those things, they all depend on heme as a catalyst to make those things, okay? It's an incredible molecule. It's, it's, it's you know, definitely a very strong contender for the coolest biomolecule on Earth. Anyway, that catalytic ability is what is the magic of the biochemistry of meat flavor. And um, so heme uh, in raw meat, so heme, when you put heme on your tongue, it catalyzes a chemical reaction that transforms an abundant amino acid, linoleic acid, that's pretty much everywhere, um, uh, into these incredibly potent odorants, okay, that are among the most potent odorants, meaning the, the number of the concentration required for you to detect them, among the most potent odorants that have ever been discovered. And they smell and taste like blood, okay? So, so heme produces that bloody flavor by, by catalyzing um, that reaction. But it also, when, when you have a heme protein, like the one that's in muscle tissue, myosin, when you cook meat at, at the cooking temperature of meat, myosin unfolds, the heme molecule is exposed. It kind of sets off an explosion of chemistry as a catalyst and also gets oxidized, which is why your meat turns from red to brown when you, when you cook it. So it's, it's just, uh, it's a critical thing about it. Meat, okay, and I, I could tell you more about it, but we don't have time. And the the um, the thing about heme is it's not just important for you know beef flavor or some kind of meat flavor. It is the critical catalyst, the magic ingredient for meat flavor, pretty much full stop. Even even fish flavor, the the characteristic fishy flavors and aromas are products of heme catalyzed reactions. Okay, this is just an aside, but this is a paper that was published in uh, you know, a, a journal that's very near and dear to my heart, PLOS One, about um, uh, six or seven years ago. And it, it was just cool and weird and, and, and random, but um, what guys did was they took um, these molecules, they're, they're diagrammed on the left, are the blood odor compounds produced by heme catalyzed oxidation of linoleic acid and um, put them on a block of wood and put them in proximity to um, carnivores um, just to see how they would react to this signal. So you have a hyena there. I don't know. I think that's a Tasmanian devil and a tiger. I have no idea what those are. Maybe they're wolves or something. Um, and what they, what they observe is this very remarkable characteristic sort of stereotype behavior. Which is they made a beeline for this, this chunk of wood and they started, you know, looking at it and just showing their love and, um, and then you know, guarding it as if it were basically the carcass of an animal or something like that. Okay. I don't know exactly what that means, but I think, you know, it's just amusing. But I think it is possible that one of the reasons that people say they don't just like me, but they crave it is that it may trigger, this may, this, these, these are the compounds that are like the most potent odorants. You need a tiny amount to be able to detect it and smell blood. It's, it's evolutionarily advantageous to be able to detect the smell of blood because it basically tells you two of the hardest to obtain nutrients um, that you require, protein and iron, are, are somewhere in the vicinity in abundance. And, uh, and so it triggers this um, behavior. I don't know whether that's, you know, Actually, that's, that's an overstatement of what we know, I'm sure, but it's, it's just interesting, okay. And besides, that's the ridiculousness of a article showing a bunch of carnivores licking a piece of wood, um, and some plus one. So, okay, so we need a heme protein to catalyze the core flavor chemistry of meat. So um, now we have the challenge of, we need a lot of heme to be able to produce all the meat that the world consumes cover the plant with cows. So how do we find it? Okay, so I had the idea, one of many ideas I've had in my career that I thought was genius at the time and turned out to actually be dumb, but um, that uh, we, the way we would get is 
Give to the fact that legumes, this is a pea plant, but same is true of soybean and all other legumes, have these little structures on their roots called root nodules, which are the little organs that fix nitrogen. They turn atmospheric nitrogen uh, into bioavailable forms. And because the reaction is oxygen sensitive, they use a heme protein called leg hemoglobin to buffer the oxygen concentration uh, in these, in these uh, structures. And I knew that, I don't know why, uh, from from decades ago when I just randomly heard it. So I thought, okay, great. And I did a calculation based on, and you can look, this is what happens when you cut open a, a root nodule. It looks like you cut open a steak. It's, they have a lot of, of heme in them. Um, I calculated how much uh, of this heme protein, like hemoglobin, would be in the root nodules of the US soybean crop. And it seemed like there might be enough just in the root nodules of the US soybean crop to match all the heme and all the meat consumed in the US. So, um, so it seemed like a great solution. So I founded the company. One of the first big projects we did, sort of illustrated here, sort of to kind of show the ludicrousness of it, but um, that we would, we would figure out how to harvest root nodules and extract hemoglobin from them. And so we spent a big chunk of our then small R&D team, spent a lot of time in Minnesota and, and Southern Texas and various places on soybean farms harvesting soybean roots. We created this ridiculous contraption you see on the right, which is basically a street sweeper that we rented. And we sort of jacked it up on its hind legs and, um, and juxtaposed it to a, a janitor broom and, and turned, it, turned it on and used it to kind of tear apart soybean roots and remove the root nodules. and and threw them against this piece of plywood here and we collected it and so forth. Anyway, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but as it turned out, it was a pretty ridiculously bad idea. It took us maybe a year to be convinced of this. Um, and there's a million reasons why it's a bad idea, but basically it's, it's, it's irreducibly expensive and digging up roots is not good for the climate. And so we decided to go to plan B, okay. So chalk one up, and by the way, but I like to use this illustration because what it shows is, you know, you have to not be afraid to try things that in retrospect turn out to be ridiculous. And even though in retrospect, this turned out to be ridiculous, I'm still kind of proud of it because I felt like, well, you just gotta do this stuff to figure out the right way of doing it. Um, okay, but anyway, so that was the wrong way. So next thing we did was we said, okay, well now, Obviously, we're going to just have to find a, a way to express it um, by genetic engineering. And that meant we could, we could might as well just pick the best heme protein for our purposes. So we screened uh, one of our scientists, Rachel Fraser, um, uh, picked 36 different uh, heme proteins from all over the place, from you know, Hell's Gate, which is a, a thermophilic bacterium that lives in a deep sea vent near, near New Zealand, um, uh, Snecocystis, um, uh, which is a, a blue green algae. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, worms and tetrahymena and paramecium and various plants. And then also bovine myoglobin, which is the heme protein from, from cow muscle tissue. And basically we, we tried to figure out which one was the best. And we were looking at how stable they were against oxidation. So that's this, this figure on the right, how soluble they were, how robust they were in various ways, what their denaturation temperature is. So for example, the Hell's Gate heme protein had the unfortunate property that you could, you could just cook your meat forever and it stayed bright red because that protein is very resistant to thermal den denaturation as you might expect and so forth. Anyway, at the end of that search, lo and behold, it turned out of all the proteins we looked at, like hemoglobin, uh, soy like hemoglobin was the best for making meat. In fact, much better than bovine myoglobin, which didn't evolve to be optimized for meat. It was evolved to be optimized to keep a cow healthy, but it's actually a pretty crappy heme protein for making meat. It, it oxidizes very quickly. That's why your meat turns brown in the freezer, refrigerator. Okay, this is just a complete random aside, but it's just, it's just this is kind of like the fun of being a scientist. You know, some, some things you learn are kind of useless, but just cool. So one of the heme proteins we looked at was uh, a heme binding protein from bacteria, Peptobacterium carotivorum. And the thing I love about it is that uh, when we purified it, it was this vivid kind of purple magenta color. And uh, I just thought it was just awesome, so beautiful. I happen to like purple. Um, but obviously a pretty terrible heme protein if you're gonna make uh, meat for humans because 
I don't think people are going to want to eat uh, fuchsia colored steaks. So, um, but just an insult thing. So then we um, picked our, our protein to express, so like hemoglobin, and we basically engineered yeast to produce it uh, at high levels. And that was a very complex genetic engineering um, project. Um, yeasts are fully capable of synthesizing heme, so we had to kind of turbocharge their, their natural enzymes for, for synthesizing heme, and then we put in the gene for like hemoglobin. And uh, now we have um, uh, yeast cells that basically, if you look at all the proteins inside the cell, like 90% of the total protein in that cell is like hemoglobin. So, and yet they, they're, they're amazingly healthy. But anyway, these are colonies of those yeast cells. So the little white ones you can see there are what the yeast look like uh, um, before being transformed and the red ones are, are, are heme producing yeast. And, and then we had to figure out how to produce this at scale. I won't take you the, the whole story, but it turns out scaling things up is, a, is an interesting challenge in its own right. You know, uh, um, I'll just a, a little aside. When I was a graduate student, um, I was studying uh, uh, topoisomerase called DNA gyrus to try to figure out how it worked. And, and uh, this was before basically um, expression systems for foreign proteins had been really developed. That's how old I am. And um, we had to purify it from just a, a wild type cell. And it's a pretty inabundant enzyme. So I would spend days in the cold room, uh, starting with you know, kilograms of E. coli um, to purify this protein. And I would proudly at the end of it, you know, have like a hundred micrograms of it. Okay. So the thing that that just kind of is, is dramatic about this is that now um, we are producing like of this protein like hemoglobin, we're producing tons of it, okay? It's, it's, you know, more than a billion times higher yield than my best yield as a graduate student. So I'm glad I got out of that business. So, um, okay, so now we developed all this stuff. There was obviously a lot, a lot more besides just the, the, the heme protein and, and the flavor chemistry and so forth. We had to figure out um, like the basic biophysics of how, how meat changes texture with cooking and how to find plant proteins that, that would match the, the mechanical properties of various um, components of meat and, and blah, 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 blah. But, um, about three years ago, we, we, came, we came up with our, our first product, which is um, uh, raw ground beef. So you can see on the right, it's cooking. Um, and basically the point is, and we're using heme from yeast as our, our heme source and all the other stuff. And we have that product, which I think of as a proof of concept, okay? Um, I think it's pretty awesome, but um, it's mainly a proof of concept that this is doable, okay? This is like a very, an early version of a product that even today is getting better and better and better. But oh, I'll say from a sustainability standpoint, um, it's vastly better than a cow version. We've done a, uh, well, we didn't do an independent uh, life cycle auditing company, audited our um, life cycle environmental impact. And the bottom line is we use 125th the land area um, one eighth the water, uh, one ninth the greenhouse gas emissions, one twelfth the uh, uh, nutrient pollutions pollution um, to produce our product compared to the the cow version. Um, and just as an aside, um, if you're more resource efficient, we use less land, less water, less fertilizer. That's why there's less water pollution. Um, we because we need to grow less plants, not more because we convert the plants to meat with one-to-one -one efficiency on a protein basis, as opposed to 30 to one for a cow and 10 to one for a pig. Um, you actually need less plants if you produce meat directly from plants, not more. And so less farm labor and uh, no farm labor chasing the animals around and so forth. So all the things that drive the, the costs of meat production are lower when you do it this way, which means the economics are structurally better and that's why I can say with such confidence that uh, at scale, our products will be cheaper to produce and cheaper to sell. Okay, so this is just some data on how this is performing. What matters is, do consumers want it? Because otherwise, 
how can we compete against the meat industry unless we make pro products that consumers prefer? Well, we know today because we're on the market for a while, 90% of our customers are omnivores. They're people who have eaten meat in the past month, eat meat from animals in the past month. So that's exactly the target customer. We do not care about vegans and vegetarians. I mean, I'm, I'm a vegan, but I'm not the target customer. And we spend no time thinking about them. They're just a waste of product as far as I'm concerned, because unless it's competing with the animal products, it's not accomplishing anything. So 90% of our customers are exactly the target customers. When those consumers, and we've done tons and tons of uh, studies with wild consumers captured in the wild, um, uh, and, and, and they know it's plant-based, three out of four of them say they would choose over the cow version. When we do, um, uh, when we send them home with com consumers uh, and so forth, 70% of them say it's as good or better just in performance than, than the cow version. So it's actually doing, from a product standpoint, what we intended to do. And 70% of every customer who's ever bought our product um, has become a repeat customer. And, and nine, nine out of 10, no, 90% of them rated nine out of 10, no, nine or 10 out of 10, sorry, uh, um, on a scale of 10 um, uh, in terms of um, product quality. Is it, do, do, do they like it? Are they satisfied? So it's delivering. And a very important statistic, we know from uh, consumer receipt data. So supermarkets, in case you didn't know it, spy on you relentlessly and they know everything you've bought, you know, pretty much for a very long time at their store. So they can tell us that when people buy the Impossible Burgers, which is what we call it, um, uh, those scale, 80% of those sales come directly at the expense of an animal product. They're, they're, they're not buying the animal product and replacing it with ours, which is exactly the intended behavior. And the other thing that I just think is how we know this is that we're on a good trajectory is only 1.5% of US households have ever bought our product. So it's, it's actually selling extremely well and yet almost nobody knows about it. So, so there's a huge potential there. Um, so this is to address um, a, an issue that a lot of people um, will say to me, well, 15 years, that's just totally ridiculous. You can't possibly do something that's this transformative in 15 years, right? Well, actually, there's many examples in history where a technology that does a better job uh, at the fundamental thing it's intended to do um, sweepingly replaces the incumbent technology, even if that incumbent technology has, has been the dominant technology for millennia. That happened, uh, it's happened many times. This is an illustration of it. Uh, at the turn of the last century, um, essentially every American household had a horse as its means of transportation. Automobiles came in and over a period of about 15 years between around 1910 and 1920, a tiny, you know, the number of households with horses dropped precipitously to close to zero and the number of households that had replaced them with cars approached 100%, okay? So pretty much a complete replacement uh, in less than two decades. So this is doable. I mean, the replacement of a film camera with a digital camera from the time the first total piece of garbage digital camera came out, cost $1,000, had like 100,000 pixels and so forth, had stored eight pictures till Kodak was bankrupt and the entire film industry was essentially dead, was less than a decade. So um, that's why I'm optimistic. Anyway, thank you all. I'm sorry for that rambling spiel, but uh, hopefully I've planted a few challenging questions in your mind and, and now you can let loose.